there are, uh, was a patient that I had when I practiced in Detroit. Um, all these are old stories, but sometimes the old stories are the best ones. And she was um, a red-headed woman who met the stereotype of like a Lucille Ball kind of nutty redhead. Now, I don't mean to cast aspersions on redheads. I was telling this story in a class in California, and there's this one red-headed lady there, and she just like glared at me, and I said, no, no, I don't mean you. <laughs> But, but I don't mean to do that, but there's this, what I'm saying is there's sort of this, this new, Lucille Ball kind of gave this, um, this sort of nutty, wacky, red-headed kind of stereotype thing. Well, she was like that kind of patient. She was that kind of person. She was a little, just a little eccentric and a little wacky at times. And a real outgoing woman. And um, she had these situations where she'd have like this terrible pain that sort of caused her to double over in her, in her upper abdomen and chest. And, when we looked at her and tested her, we found out it was a hiatal hernia. So we treated her for a hiatal hernia, and she was much better. And she came back and she said, but you know, what happens if I haven't seen you for a while, and this thing recurs? I said, well, what you do is, you take your fingers, you go to the tip of your breastbone, you go out about three finger widths, and you take your fingers and you massage down on your stomach, try to pull your stomach down out of your diaphragm, because I explained to her how the stomach would push up, she had to pull it down, grab it and pull it down, mechanically pull it down. Sit in a chair or something and pull it down. And I taught her how to do that, make all her own hiatal hernia correction. So she was in a very fancy store, one of the more ritzy stores, in, uh, in one of the women's stores in one of the Gross Point, uh, or Birmingham, I guess it was, one of the suburbs of, the, of uh, one of the more wealthy suburbs of, of uh, Detroit. And she was shopping in there one day and she was bending over looking for some underwear, something in a, in a box or something and that they had a display there. And what happens is when the stomach pushes up through the diaphragm, if you bend over, that increases intra-abdominal pressure. Sometimes that can push it up. And she's bending over there looking for whatever she's looking for. And all of a sudden, she gets a serious pain in her lower chest, upper head. Oh, and she's, oh, oh. And it's got her in such a way because it's a diaphragmatic involvement. You see what's coming. It's a diaphragmatic involvement. And it's a hiatal hernia acting that she can't really talk very well. So the staff right away sees her. She can't quite talk except she says, oh, it hurts, you know, and she's got her hands over her chest. So they call 911 and they take her back into the, we, uh, the changing rooms the, where you change garments, try clothes on. And they take her out of the changing rooms and she sits her down in a chair there and they run out and she's sitting in that chair. They run out to, you know, direct the, the 911 people. And she's sitting in the chair and she thinks, oh, wait, this is what I had before. This is what Dr. Schmidt told me about. All I need to do is just do this thing. And so she starts pulling down in her abdomen like this, and she pulls her hiatal hernia down, and all of a sudden all her pain goes away. And she gets up and she goes, oh, that feels better. And she walks out of the store, and because she's kind of the nature of kind of wacky, interesting person that she was, the EMS people are coming in with the gurney, and all the store people are following him in to show him where she is. She walks right past him, walks out the store, and says, oh, I'm okay now. And never gives an explanation, just leaves. Left them there in a, in a rush. So, she fixed herself, but she had what looked like cardiac symptoms. So I tell you these stories, but I said before, always differentiate cardiac, differentially diagnose cardiac problems first. But the symptoms can be many. It's a great mimic. Hyaluronic hernia is a great mimic. And it can create all kinds of digestive symptoms or symptoms above the diaphragm or symptoms below the diaphragm. And it can also contribute to other problems further down the digestive tract because of maldigestion in the stomach and or because if the sphincter is compromised, at the hiatus, at the esophageal hiatus there, the sphincter could be compromised at the ileocecal valve. Or the sphincter could be compromised at the pyloric sphincter. Or the sphincter could be compromised at the anal sphincter, since all the sphincters are more or less related in that sympathetic parasympathetic chain. So here is, in page or tab 21 in the QA book, the hiatal hernia GERD challenge. We do the hiatal hernia static challenge. The doctor pushes upward into the left side of the diaphragm. If a strong muscle weakens, and usually we use the pec clavicular, but it doesn't have to be, we pull the stomach down out of the hiatus. We follow with injury recall technique distraction of the talus bilaterally. Most tidal hernias slash GERD are a compromise of the diaphragm which requires IRT. Not all, but most. We then can rub Chapman's reflexes for the diaphragm which is on the entire sternum. Then what we do is we recognize that the area of the diaphragm attachment is a, a, especially around in the back around T12 and L1, all the inside of the ribs and so on. We'll go to that in a minute. But the, the uh, area of the dorsal lumbar junction is 
oftentimes fixated in what we call a fixation in applied kinesiology. And a bilateral weakness of the lower trapezius muscles, here number four, is an indication of a dorsal lumbar T12, L1, L2 fixation um, in AK. And so we find a weak lower trapezius would indicate a problem with that T12, L1, L2 area. And if it's weak by muscle weak bilateral, we've got to correct that fixation to free up the mechanics to allow the diaphragm to function properly. And we'll go through this procedure, how we do that in a minute. Then we are going to adjust the spine in the direction of challenge weakness. And we're going to retest the lower trapezius to confirm correction. So we're going to make both a mechanical correction on the diaphragm and then a mechanical correction on the spine where the diaphragm attaches. Mechanical correction on the diaphragm is to pull the stomach down out of it. And then mechanical correction on the diaphragm is to do Chapman's reflex for the diaphragm to improve its function. We make a mechanical correction on the spine. And then we're going to further check foot turn in. And if it's unequal, we're going to perform autogenic facilitation on the psoas muscle to reduce the tension on the side of restricted foot turn in. We're going to actually do autogenic inhibition to turn that muscle down. There are other ways of doing it we'll talk about also. And then we recheck the hiatal hernia challenge to confirm correction. This is the whole procedure. So there are, most of what we do for a hiatal hernia or GERD is mechanics. Most of what everyone else does is chemical. Take this pill. Bob Blake's book is a great explanation. And his first patient he talks about, about how to get patients understanding of mechanics affecting their gut in the case of the hiatal hernia or GERD and why they don't necessarily need to take a pill to shut off hydrochloric acid production. To shut off hydrochloric acid production because it's refluxing and they're afraid it's going to destroy the esophagus, fine, but they don't do anything to try to get to the underlying cause of why the mechanics are off in the spine and in the, in the psoas muscle and in the diaphragm itself to allow for normal diaphragmatic function so the hiatus can stay closed. Hiatus is kind of like your eye, kind of opens and closes like that. And so if it doesn't shut tight, it opens and closes, it doesn't shut tight, stuff can come up. Reflex can come up or the stomach can come up. And over a period of time it gets stretched out and actually the stomach can come up. So we have to do the mechanics to correct the diaphragm to fix the hiatal hernia. We also have to pull the stomach down out of there in case it's up in, in the diaphragm hiatus. We have to pull it down first. If you don't pull the stomach down first, it's like putting your tongue between your teeth and then closing your teeth. You want to pull your tongue out and then close your teeth. You want to pull this out before you tone up the diaphragm. Okay? So, you have a pamphlet called Diaphragm, and the diaphragm talks about a number of things related to diaphragm. Um, and uh, it's a patient education pamphlet from Systems DC. It's also got good pictures of the diaphragm, and the reason I gave you one is you might want to get these from Dave Walther's company because it shows the different openings of the diaphragm. It shows the hiatus, and it shows the vena cava, and it shows the aorta, and so on. But you can use this for patients to show how they're all embedded by the muscles and how the hiatus goes around the muscles here, muscles uh, and go around the hiatus, and how important it is to have adequate um, diaphragmatic activity to control the reflux and controlling hiatal hernia symptoms. So here is a picture of the diaphragm. Notice that the diaphragm shows some of the psoas leaves coming up into it. Psoas muscle is very important in diaphragmatic activity. This is the diaphragm from above. Here's the esophageal sphincter. Here's, of course, the diaphragm. Here's the aorta, here's the spine. Here's the aorta just in front of the spine. Here's the esophagus, and here's the inferior vena cava. Okay, there's the diaphragm from above. Here's the diaphragm from below. Again, the aorta, here's the spine, the aorta, the esophageal sphincter right next to the aorta, and the vena cava right here. Now look at from below here, look at the muscles that come up. Here's the, here's the whole diaphragm. But look at this part of the muscle that comes up around here and surrounds this esophageal sphincter. This is the right psoas crus. And the left psoas crus comes up like this. And the right psoas crus comes up and across. And they, they actually help to form the esophageal sphincter. And so the psoas muscles intimately blend with the diaphragm in this area to help to give support to that hiatus, interestingly enough. Here's another picture of the diaphragm. In this case, we can see more clearly the central tendon, which is this whole central area, which isn't much muscle, but it's the central tendon to which all the muscles attach. Here we see, again, the similar picture, but now we see the psoas muscles coming up right and left and blending intimately in here 
after they come out of their sheath, blending up intimately in here with the diaphragm. Here we see the stomach with right here, and you can see a little bit of the diaphragm here. And it's that stomach which can push its way up through the diaphragm. And then here's the heart right above that. So there's a close proximity of these tissues and the heart resting on the diaphragm and the stomach pushing up and you saw where the aorta was. And so you can get symptoms radiating from the diaphragm, from the hiatus, from the stomach up into the chest and also can create some irritation of the heart, create some referred pain areas from that general same area, which mimic the heart. So we have the diaphragm again, the stomach below and the heart here and the lung here, of course. So the diaphragm inserts into the central tendon, as we said, and this is a picture that's just designed to show the central tendon primarily. And, and uh, here's the aorta, here's the vena cava, and here's the esophageal sphincter. Now notice it's to the left. Here's the spine, of course. Here's the, here's the uh, vertebral body. And notice that this is to the left of center a little bit, where the esophageal sphincter is. Again, we see the psoas coming up. And blending in with the diaphragm up in here and coming up through here and blending with the diaphragm. And the origins of the diaphragm are seen in this slide. They're from the ribs, they're from the vertebral bodies and uh, the lumbar spine, all the way down really as far as maybe L3. And they're from all inside the ribs and they insert into the central tendon. So here's this picture which shows the psoas coming up here and here and helping to wrap around to create this esophageal sphincter to give it more support. So when we look at the hiatal hernia, we have to evaluate the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is evaluated very simply by just having patients breathe in and out and looking at how their chest expands. Does it do it fully? Does it do it especially symmetrically? So you put your hands on the side of the patient's ribs and look at the center, say breathe in and out and see if the hands move equally on inspiration and expiration. Provide a little bit of pressure to see if the body can contract as the patient breathes in and move the ribs out and then see if it goes in equally as well as extends out equally laterally and medially when you're checking the patient with respiratory activity. We can do it from behind. Sometimes it's best to do it from both directions if you don't see the imbalance. Inspiration, patient expands the ribs, doesn't move out equally on both sides, and then expiration. And you can notice how it looks like my hands are moved around forward more from this picture to this picture. But this is just, my hands are in the same place, the patient breathes in, the fingers move laterally, the patient breathes out, the fingers move medially, and you should have symmetrical lateral medial movement on both of them. You can measure a spirometer or some other vital capacity meter, which is a measure of diaphragmatic function to a degree. Not just a measure of lung capacity, but also a measure of diaphragmatic function, and you can readily change spirometry or vital capacity by changing the diaphragm. We've done it all the time. 